We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, ACC. How are you guys today? All right. Hey, uh, I have to say, I was so excited about yesterday's men's breakfast. I mean, seriously, about 100 guys all gathered together, and it was just a great time to be together. Uh, listen, a lot of guys got up early, breakfast, so can we just take a moment and just say thank you to those guys? Thank you so much. Listen, there's a lot that is going on here at ACC, and we definitely don't want you guys to miss out. Uh, as Pastor Matt shared, uh, and as, as Justin was sharing, the fact that we are doing mission work in Ecuador, that we're, that we're actually partnering with our mission partners, you know, we're doing it there, we're doing it in South Africa, Honduras, as well as the Dominican. And if you are interested in that, there's about 50 people who are already planning on going around the world to do this work. But that can also be you. So if you're interested in that, we want to encourage you. Talk to people over the next steps, and uh, we would love to partner with you as we partner with God. Well, today we're going to continue on in our message going through the book of Daniel. But before we do that, let's go to Lord with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for how you work with humanity. Father, we thank you for how you love us. And so this morning, as we come to your word, we ask that you would reveal the truth. Father, that you would download what you want into our hearts and into our minds and ultimately into our hands so that we put these things into action. Father, I ask for boldness. I ask for clarity of speech. And Lord, I thank you for your amazing grace that I need just as much today as the first day that I came to know you. Father, please speak in this place today, we ask in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. You know, many years ago when I was in eighth grade, I recall getting a new, brand spanking new leather jacket. Well, really new to me. It was my dad's leather jacket. And I looked at it, and as a kid, my first reaction was, is that really leather? Like, I really thought that was like plastic, you know, faux leather, something like that. And my dad insisted, no, this is real leather. I'm like, all right, I don't know any better. So I wore this jacket with confidence and vigor, and I was like, yeah, I got a leather jacket. And then John Ott came along. John Ott, as it were, was my protagonist. He said, that's not leather. That's pleather. I said, no, it is leather. He, no, 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 no. I'm sorry, man. I got I to gotta, I gotta break it to you. It's not leather. I said, no, it is. In fact, actually, I am so confident of it, I will bet you $100 and I walked away, and a couple of days later, I was looking at my new-to-me jacket that I was so proud of that my dad told me was leather. And as I looked at it, there was a little tag on the inside that indicated otherwise. So I did what any person with a little bit of pride and a little bit of arrogance did, could do. I grabbed hold of that little tag, and I ripped it right out. Problem evaded. Jonna, if you are joining us online, I owe you $100, okay? <laughs> I'm going to get a letter or something at some point. I don't know. In any case, here's the deal. We all have moments in our lives that we struggle with arrogance and pride. And I know that we want to kind of bring those words down like pride. Isn't that such a strong word? Arrogance, isn't that a little strong? Yes, it's pride and arrogance. And we all deal with this, every single one of us. It doesn't matter what it is. And it can, it can trip us up along the way. This morning, we're going to actually be looking, again, in the book of Daniel, we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 5. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and open up there. That's where we're going to be this morning. And as we come to Daniel chapter 5, what you have to understand is we are in Babylon. And in the city of Babylon, this is an impenetrable city. 
They, there are records of how large it was. They say, you know, the, the walls were 56 miles in length, that they were 8 feet thick, that they were 320 feet high. Now, can we hear a little bit of pride, arrogance, a little bit of embellishment within that? They were really, really big walls, though. They really were, and they really were impenetrable. In fact, between services, I had somebody come, and they said, have you seen, have you seen these pictures? They're amazing. They're huge. They're all this. And yes, it is all that and a bag of chips. There was a lot of pride behind it. And as we come to this section of Scripture in chapter 5, we read these words behind those impenetrable walls. We read King Belshazzar. Now, the last few weeks, we've been talking about Nebuchadnezzar. This is the next king. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. All right, so check this out. At this point in time, there's a big party going on. There's like a thousand people. They're all partying hardy. And he has made the decisively bad move of bringing in these cups, plates, all this stuff, all this gold that was taken from the temple in Jerusalem. This starts out our bad idea. And it goes on and it says, so they brought the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold, silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. It's like they just couldn't find enough false gods to worship. They were getting to all the idols. And when I read this, I imagine in that moment, there were Jews in that palace who were seeing this go on, that were just, their hearts were being broken. That was, it was straight to the heart. He didn't acknowledge the God of heaven in all of this. And let's just say, this is the beginning of a really bad day for this king. This gets to our first point. When true humility is lacking, pride likes to flex. You know what I'm saying? When true humility is lacking, pride likes to, to flex. In fact, in the New Testament, in the book of Galatians, an early follower of Jesus named Paul, he writes this. He says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. He reaps what he sows. In this moment, Belshazzar has mocked the God of heaven. And there's going to be consequences, as we're going to see. Picking up in verse 5, it says, Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. All right, for some of you guys, you remember Adam's family. Okay, I think it was called Thing, wasn't it? Thing is on the wall, okay? Just for a reference point. And this, these fingers, this human hand, it's writing on the wall. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. I have to tell you, when I look at this and I think of this guy partying hardy, ready to probably pass out, this may, we may actually have in the Bible the fastest moment of sobriety and waking up in all of history. Because I don't know about you guys, but if I see thing, a human hand on the wall writing, I'm paying attention not so much to what he's writing as much to that fact that there's a hand on the wall writing. This is a freaky moment. But at the end of it, after sobering up, we're told that the king summoned the enchanters, the astrologers, the diviners. Then he said to these wise men of Babylon, hey, listen, guys, whoever, whoever ultimately can read this, who can interpret this, I'm going to give you a, a purple robe. I'm going to give you some gold chains. In fact, actually, one of the things that I love about this, he says, and he will be made the third highest ruler of the kingdom. He will be the third highest ruler in the kingdom. The fact that he says 
that he will be the third highest ruler in the kingdom, this actually gives a lot of historical accuracy to what we're reading in the, in the book of Daniel because the king, king uh, is not actually number one. There's a guy who's actually ahead of this guy. He's number two. So when he's offering, you will be number three in the kingdom, he really means you will be just under me. You will be third in the kingdom. So it gives a little bit of historical accuracy. But recognize, he is basically calling out to all the people who are supposed to know what's going on, who are supposed to have all the answers when crazy stuff like this happens. Yet nobody can interpret it. Nobody has a clue what's going on. In fact, actually, the letters that are up there, there's no vowel pointings. It's just consonants. So imagine reading something without any vowels, and you don't know who the person is or what's being said. You just know that a hand showed up on the wall and wrote something, and it's like gibberish. In the midst of this, we find in verse 10, the queen, which, by the way, when it says queen, it can also, uh, you, you might hear queen mother, queen grandmother, okay? This is not the king's wife, but this is most likely the grandmother or the mother. So the queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. You, you don't know what just happened, okay? But don't be alarmed. Don't be, look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom, who has the spirit of the holy gods in him, she says. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. You know what I love about this part? Daniel, by this time, he has been part of the kingdom for many, many, many years. He has been exiled from Israel into Babylon. He has been raised up in this kingdom, and as he's been raised, he has served under kings like Nebuchadnezzar. And now, now it would be very easy in his older age. I don't say old because he's probably in his 60s, and 60 is not that old today. We live very long, but here's the deal. Hear this very clearly. Daniel is old, but he's not forgotten. Daniel is old, but he's not forgotten. And for some of you, you need to hear that. Listen, you're getting older, but you are not forgotten. It's just like my, my buddy Anthony and I, many years ago, we had this conversation. We said, we are now living the stories and the adventures that our kids and our grandkids will tell each other, that we will tell them even and for generations to come. You may be older, but you are not forgotten. People tell the stories. And here's the thing. It may have looked like Daniel had been kind of put out here, but the queen shows up and she says, you know, there was a guy here who used to be able to take care of this stuff that your guys can't take care of. In fact, he was over these guys. And then it goes on in verse 12, and it says, he did this. He did this because Daniel, whom the king called Belshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Difficult problems like you are having right now, king. Call for Daniel and he will tell you what the writing means. I hope you caught what just happened here. Daniel was exiled. He's in Babylon. He's given a new name, Belteshazzar. But she doesn't refer to him. She explains that that was his name, but she refers to him with his real Hebraic name, Daniel. And she says, listen, you should call for Daniel. Don't call for some other name. Call for him. Be respectful of him. He's going to be able to bring answers that you've not been able to get up until this point, King. And that leads to our second point. True wisdom is found in knowing who and when to ask for help. Who and when to ask for help. Sometimes we go to the wrong people and sometimes we go at the wrong time. It matters. Sometimes you go to your friends and they don't really know the answers. If you catch my drift. Surround yourself with people who know the answers, as it were. 
In Daniel 5, 17, we finally come to a place where Daniel has basically been told, hey, listen, I will give you what I promised to these other guys. If you can interpret this, if you can tell me what the meaning is. And then it says, then Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it says, what it means. He says, listen, I don't need any of that. And when I read this, it's kind of like saying, listen, I don't want you to think that just because I gave you an interpretation of what it means, that I'm just trying to get something. In fact, I don't need anything. I have everything that I need. And maybe he even has a little bit of understanding about what's coming in a minute. But let's go on. In verse 18, it says, Your majesty, the most high king, gave your father, Nebuchadnezzar, sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high positions he gave him, all nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. And he goes on to say, listen, he was in charge. He humbled somebody, they got humbled. He took their life, their life was taken. Whatever it was, he was in charge. And then he says in verse 20, but when his heart became arrogant, that's Nebuchadnezzar, became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like an ox. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. He recalls the story of his father, of King Nebuchadnezzar, of what happened. Something, something that Belshazzar should have taken heed of in his leadership. In fact, it says in verse 22, Daniel makes it very clear. He says, but you, Belshazzar, His son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. You knew all of this. Why didn't you learn from his mistakes? Why didn't you learn from his trials? So often, we want to do it on our own, don't we? You remember when you were were in high school and, you know, you were just starting out and you're like, I'm going to conquer the world if I could just get out of mom and dad's house right? If I could just stop having to be home by 11 o'clock. Come on! See, there's a difference between humility and humiliation. Humiliation, it's, it's powerlessness. It's, it's dishonoring. Humility is what God is calling Him and us to. Humility is a willingness to listen and know that there's a difference between hearing and listening. When I'm on my phone, when you're on your phone, we're on there and What's that? What? Yeah? We are hearing the words, but we are not listening, right? Would you just put down your phone? What? I was listening to you. No, you weren't. What did I say? I don't know. It's something along those lines. But humility is a willingness to listen, to admit when you were wrong, and to even consider others better than yourself. It's okay to own things. I had a, my, my friend uh, Al, he used to say, whoever wins to the cross first wins. Humility always wins. This leads to our third point. That is knowing the truth and living according to the truth, they're not the same thing. You can know the truth and not really do anything with it. You may have head knowledge, but you don't have heart knowledge. And you certainly don't have hand knowledge, that is doing actions. It's important to know this. In fact, in the New Testament, another early follower of Jesus by the name of James, he puts it really clear. I mean, it's, it's a mic drop moment. He says, you believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Whew. I mean, seriously, that is one of those mic drop moments where, you know, people will say, well, you know, I believe in God. That's great. Even demons do that. Whoa. I mean, that is a bold statement, but it is true. It really matters. 
We go on and we pick up in, in uh, verse 23 and we continue on with Daniel. And it says, instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You're taking on God. It's not a great idea, king. You had the goblets and, and all these things and he recounts the story. Because you threw a ruckus party and you got out of control and you thought that you could take on God, that's why the hand got sent to give you a clear message. So he reveals, you should have learned, you got arrogant, you shouldn't have done that, and now he's going to tell them, here's what it means. He says, this is, what the, inscrip- this is the inscription that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. Number, number, weight, divisions. The fact that he says, Mene, Mene, twice. Anytime that you're reading the Bible and it says something like, verily, verily, if it says something twice, your ears should pick up, perk up. You should be paying attention a little bit more because there's something more going on here. And this is what's going on. He says in verse 26, here is what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. The fact that it says it twice, he's ultimately saying, he's brought your reign to an end and it's going to happen. It is what it is. Then he goes on in verse 27. Tekel, you have been weighed on a scale and found wanting. You have come up short. And then Parson, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. It's interesting in this moment because when we look at these words, what we really see in this moment is something that we will see throughout the book of Daniel. And that comes to our next point. God is in charge of who is in charge. God himself is in charge of who is in charge. So, you like who's in charge? Great, God put him there. You don't like who's in charge? Guess what? God put them there. He, her, guess what? God is in charge of who is in charge. And through the book of Daniel, we see two particular things at work. First, the sovereignty of God. God is in charge of who's in charge. And the second part, remain faithful in the midst of exile. Even when you can't see that God is moving, He is moving. Even when you don't feel that He is in control, God is in control. When I think about this, I I kind of... You know, I, I think about these pieces of wood here, okay? I think about how, you know, this represents our life right here. <clears throat> In our life, we feel pretty, pretty upright. We're doing pretty well. And, and on those days that maybe <clears throat> we're not doing so hot, we're not feeling so good about ourselves, what do we do? Well, we play the comparison game, don't we? We take somebody... With a little lower stature, maybe they got a notch out of them and, you know, hey, I can see their imperfections really easily. I see that things aren't going on and, you know, listen, I've got more education, I've been better in business, I've, you know, whatever it is, you know, I've, I, I've never gone through a divorce or, you know, I got remarried or whatever it is. We can build ourselves up. It doesn't matter what it is. Every single one of us, let's just be honest, we all do this. I do this. And we don't typically admit it to ourselves, okay? But we set ourselves up to say, I'm better than this person. We have some pride. We have some arrogance. You want to know something that's really interesting? This person, they don't see themselves the way that you do. They see them just like you do. And they find somebody else to compare themselves, and they feel better than themselves as well. You might look and you may say, oh, they're missing some teeth or they're this or that. And they say, actually, I'm doing better. I got two teeth. They don't have any. It doesn't matter what it is. But when we really want to measure up, when we really want to see where we measure up, we need to do something else. We need a different measuring stick. You see, in those moments that we compare ourselves to one another, God doesn't look at either one of us. And if I were to have a piece of wood that represented God, it would not be able to be in this room, let alone, it just would not contain anything. But you see, when we compare ourselves to one another, we look like we're something, don't we? 
But when we compare ourselves to God, we look at our neighbor and we go, you know, we're both falling up short, aren't we? We're both having issues. We're both having problems. And, and maybe you're not having a problem with what they're having a problem with. But we all have issues. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's in your family. Maybe it's in your life. Maybe it's in your work. And if you don't have those issues right now, I hate to break it to you. We all have issues at one point or another. There will always be those moments that we need to fall on grace. We need to fall on humility. And it's important that we learn, that we learn from the past. For this king, the past was King Nebuchadnezzar. The first four chapters of the book of Daniel, we see three times that Nebuchadnezzar is humbled, that he humbles himself even. You look at the story of Jonah. In Jonah, Jonah is sent to the Ninevites, and these people, they are evil. There are some bad things. But God sends a messenger to say, you guys need to get it together and repent because God's about to destroy you all. And they do. In fact, they take it so seriously that they don't just put sackcloth and ashes on themselves. They put it on the animals. But then you go to the book of Obadiah, a generation later, they've forgotten all of it. And Obadiah is basically about the Ninevites and their being judged because they didn't learn from the past. We need to learn from the past because, you know, there's going to be a day. It says in Matthew 24, 37, Jesus says, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Hear very clearly what's going to happen is People are going to be given and taken in marriage. Things, like Weddings are going to be going on. Babies are going to be being born. You know, you're going to have problems at work, whatever. And then Jesus comes back right in that moment. Now, I recognize that those who have ears to hear and eyes to see, they will be able to read the signs of the time. But guess what? For everybody else, they will not, everything will just be going on normally. When we come to the book of Romans, Paul shares these words with us. When we look at comparing ourselves to one another even. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all fall short. Every single one of us falls short. No matter how high we think we are, how, 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 how big, powerful, strong, wealthy, whatever it is, we all fall short of the glory of God. We all need to recognize our arrogance and our pride and come to God in humility We're told at the end of Daniel 29 and 31, we're told of two things that happen. One is we're told that Belshazzar actually makes good on his promise to Daniel. And he gives him the purple robe and the bling and and he says, hey, you're in charge. You know, you are a third of the kingdom. It's a very short reign because the next thing that we see in verse 31 That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. It was an impenetrable kingdom, we're told, in extra-biblical literature. It says that, yeah, everything was big, but ultimately, at the end of the day, they took the Euphrates, they moved it off to the side. The Medes and the Persians, they literally walked right into the palace and they took over the kingdom. They just took it over. You see, our pride can say, it can make us feel like we are impenetrable. But at the end of the day, the only one who's impenetrable, the only one who is worthy, the only one who is in charge of who is in charge is God in heaven. As we come to this what now moment, that we have every week. This week, I think of something that I heard from uh, an old friend, an, an old colleague. He was speaking just this last week and I, and I heard some of his sermon and he brought a good reminder. Maybe you've never heard this. Good people don't go to heaven. Good people do not go to heaven. Saved people go to heaven. People who have humbled themselves and recognize the God of heaven, that he sent his son Jesus to die in our place. When we receive him as our Lord and Savior, 
He went to the cross for you. He went to the cross for me. He died in our place. And we have to have that humility to recognize that we are not enough. We have to have the humility not to compare ourselves to others, but to compare ourselves to God. And we all fall short. Every single one of us has moments. We all have places in our lives that we don't measure up. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's in your family. Maybe it's in your life. Maybe, just maybe, up to this point, your faith, it's been like my leather coat. It's never quite been real. Sure, you got the words and everything else. You show up to Sunday every week. You come and worship. Or at least you're here for worship. But the words don't resonate with your mouth. It doesn't resonate with your body. And it doesn't resonate maybe even just beyond Sunday. Maybe you do all those things. But you go outside this church building. As soon as you get in the car, the whole family knows what's actually going on. We've all been there, parents. We've all fallen short. Amen? Yeah, it's a tough moment. So this morning, I want to challenge you to show and express your faith. If you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've never come and humbled yourself and said, God, I can't do this on my own. I need your help. Make this the day of that declaration. If you've never had that moment of saying, you know what? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that he died for my sins and rose from the dead, and I accept him as my personal Lord and Savior. Make this today. If you've never been baptized, get baptized. Jesus doesn't say that this is just for the, for the spiritual elite. He says, no, 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 no. For anybody who's going to follow me, I'm going to give an example. And if Jesus, who doesn't have any sin, sets an example of getting baptized, seriously, how would we not do such a simple thing to identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? This morning, if you need prayer, we have people here ready to pray with you. If you are at a place of, hey, I want to surrender or I want to get baptized, we have people here ready to meet you where you are. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we come to you. Father, we don't want fake faith any more than we, we want to go through the motions. Father, we ask that you would implant us with a real faith, that you would help us to walk daily with you, that you would help us to recognize those places in our lives, in our marriage, and in, in our families, in our lives, that we need to humble ourselves and run to the cross, not walk run. We ask for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.